As you could probably assume from the title, the case of Macon against the Attorney General for New South Wales is perhaps the strangest case we've looked at so far. Just so you know, I've included a number of newspaper articles from The Time which deals with this case, and some are really worth a read, so you definitely pause the video when they come up as they're quite interesting. Anyway, this rather dated case was still being used as a textbook example for similar fact evidence, which I'll explain later, when I was studying evidence law back in 2014. A case that was so strange that in 2008, James Miller and Peter Rutherford made a musical out of it. So allow me to set the scene for you. In Australia, in New South Wales, in the last few decades of the 19th century, things were really hard on the poor. From 1870 onward, there were a number of government reports about wife desertion, neglected children and the abandonment of infants. So, in 1873, the Royal Commission on the Working and Management of the Public Charities of the Colony was established. The Commission released a report on its findings just one year later in 1874. Its main recommendation was to close the current barracks-like institutions where abandoned children were required to live, and opt for a boarding-out system whereby willing families would receive a sustenance payment for keeping one of these abandoned children. The intention was to give children the moral and educational advantages of normal family life. With this system, they hoped to bring about the closure of these barracks-like institutions, namely Randwick Asylum for Destitute Children, which housed seven to 800 of these children. Of course, there is more to the report, but this is the crux which leads us to the story. After some time and difficulty, the system was successfully implemented, and by 1896, some 7,000 children had been boarded out. Our story takes place during this period in the early 1890s. In 1892, an 18-year-old woman named Amber Murray placed an advertisement in the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, hoping to find a mother to adopt her baby boy Horace, born earlier that year on the 30th of May. The child was illegitimate, and Amber Murray was unable to care for him, but offered to cover child support assistance to anyone who would take him. Her prayers were answered when John and Sarah Macon responded to her ad saying they would take care of the child for 10 shillings a week. Their daughter Blanche Macon accepted the initial payment of £3 and collected Horace from the young mother. True to her word, Amber Murray made her payments each week, which John Macon was sure to collect. Although, whenever Amber would ask to see her son, John would always make some excuse as to why she couldn't. Eventually, Amber went to the address the Macons gave her to see her child, only to find out that they had moved home. Tragically, Amber would never see her son Horace again. On October 11th of that same year, a workman by the name of James Hanoni was clearing a clogged underground drain in the backyard of a home in Burren Street, Macdonald Town, New South Wales. Of course, this work was not unusual, drains get clogged all the time, however what was blocking the drain was something not so common. Mr Hanoni discovered the source of this blockage was two bundles of foul-smelling clothing, and nestled within these clothes was the remains of two infants. Mr. Hanoni immediately contacted the police who launched an investigation of the area, finding the decomposing remains of five other infants in various places about the garden. Through tenancy records, detectives were able to trace the previous tenants of the house, John and Sarah Macon. Police searched the backyards of 11 homes the Macons had occupied since 1890, each time finding more bodies. Eventually, the police tracked them to their latest residence in Chippendale, a mere two and a half kilometres from where Mr. Hanoni made his grim discovery. They weren't there. Eventually, they were tracked to their newest family home. Again, the police investigated and again they found the bodies of even more infants. In total, 12 infant bodies were found. John and Sarah Macon were arrested, as were their daughters. Florence, aged 17. Clarice, aged 16. Blanche, aged 14. Blanche, who had collected young Horace from Amber Murray. And Daisy, aged only 11. The trial was held in the Sydney Supreme Court and was the talk of the town. The courthouse was overflowing with people and runners were providing updates to those who couldn't enter the building. The Macon's defence was that they were professional childminders who looked after babies for a weekly fee until the mother picked them up, or a suitable family was found to adopt them. Obviously, the prosecution disagreed. It was clear, as the court found, that the Macon's had found it far easier to merely murder the children and collect the weekly payments from the unaware mother. Who was the prosecution's first witness in this? Amber Murray, which is how we know her story today. However course, this is not where the story ends. Another couple testified that they had entrusted the Macons with their illegitimate child for a substantial upfront payment and weekly payments of 10 shillings until their affairs were sorted and they could again support the child. Within days of the Macons taking their child, it died. The grieving parents gave the Macons two pounds for the funeral, which they did not attend. Eventually, the Macons' own children turned against them. 
Clarice Macon took the stand and testified against her parents by identifying clothing found on one of the bodies as clothing she had seen in her mother's possession. She would infer that Amber's son Horace was murdered and buried most likely during the family stay in Redfern, in one of the many properties they had moved between since 1892. Allegedly, Justice Matthew Henry Stephen said when handing down his judgment, You took money from the mother of this child. You beguiled her with promises which you never meant to perform and which you never did perform, having determined on the death of the child. You deceived her as to your address, and you endeavoured to make it utterly fruitless that any search should be made, and finally, in order to make detection impossible, as you thought, having bereft it of life, you buried this child in your yard as you would the carcass of a dog. No one who has heard this case but must believe that you were engaged in baby farming in its worst aspect. Three yards of houses in which you lived testified, with the ghastly evidence of these bodies, that you were carrying on this nefarious, this hellish business of destroying the lives of these infants for the sake of gain. Now, I said allegedly because I can't actually find this judgment in any law journal. I did, however, find an article from the Sydney Morning Herald dated the 31st of March, 1893, which does report on this case and does contain the above quote by his honour. Nonetheless, the death sentence was passed on the Macons, and this fact is well known. The case was subject to two appeals, in the New South Wales Supreme Court, again, and later to the Privy Council, where its principle was declared and it has since remained. John Macon eventually was hanged. However, Sarah Macon was instead sentenced to life imprisonment with hard labour. She was released in 1911 after serving nearly 20 years behind bars. She died in relative obscurity in 1918. So what legal principles come as a result of this unbelievable tale? Well, as I said before, similar fact evidence. Now, similar fact evidence is evidence that an accused has performed conduct similar to that charged on other occasions or has a connection with the events similar to those giving rise to the charges. In most simple terms, this means generally evidence of a past similar event should not be admissible unless there are exceptional circumstances, as was the situation in this case. A corpse in the backyard of a house you recently moved into could be a rather grim coincidence, However, that possibility ceases to exist when there are dead bodies found in every backyard you've owned. Lord Herschel, in this case, gave us the Macon formula. The Macon formula has two arms, which have been subject to change over history, so do take them with a pinch of salt. Firstly, the courts will not allow evidence to be admitted of previous crimes, offences, misconduct, solely for the purposes of showing that the accused was a sort of person likely to commit this crime. This is called an exclusion rule. Now, it's not really true anymore, but they will allow it in criminal trials, but there's a very high standard of proof required. The second limb is such evidence may be admitted if it is relevant to an issue in the case, for example, to rebut a defense of whether actions were accidental or not, and this is a rule of inclusion. So for the sake of clarity, legal principles come from the cases cited in the description at the beginning of this video. The story of this case, however, was taken from a number of sources, and as I noted earlier in the video, I couldn't find the first instance of this case. I can only find the appeals. So, that is the very strange case and the history of Macon and the Attorney General for New South Wales. This was certainly the hardest case to put together, and I'd certainly love to hear your thoughts on the video and of this very bizarre case. Thank you for watching.